Welcome back everybody to me re-recording a video because <laughs> my camera fucked up. Well, the SD card got corrupted and uh, files got lost. So I'm re-recording a video and there's no more sunshine and we are like closer to nightfall <clears throat> um, now than we were like a couple of hours ago. But, you know, sometimes life sucks and if life gives you mediocrity, you make mead. Which is what I'm drinking today, um, <laughs> before we get into the video. Do um, you remember way back I did the video on um, how to make mead? And then I did it again because my camera did stupid things? Yes, there's a pattern there. Well, this is the one I made the first time round, which is mead with um, red currant juice in there to add a bit of acid and that's what I'm drinking today because we're talking about medieval fantasy and not any medieval fantasy but one of the best ones out there and one of the ones you probably never heard about which is a bloody shame and we're gonna change that now we're talking about Soldrin's Garden book one of the Leoness trilogy by Jack Vance from 1983 the entire trilogy is 1983, 1985, and 1989. Books two and three are called um, The Green Pearl and Maduk. And we'll talk about those in due time, which is, you know, the next week, I guess. Um, and yeah, I just felt it's time to talk about that because no one else does, and you're all missing out. So we're going to do the same thing as usual. I'll do a bit of like a generic, like why you all should go and read this. And seriously, you should. And uh, then I'll have a long pull of my ale, which is mead today, <laughs> of my mead, and talk about some specific aspects of it. And we'll see how all of that goes. Right? Ready? Here we go. Cheers. All right, let's go with the generic stuff. Who is Jack Vance? Why should you read his stuff? Jack Vance is an American author, was an American author. He died a couple of years ago in a very venerable old age. And he's one of the most fundamental writers of fantastic literature of the 20th century. Has had probably more impact on the fantasy genre than you might realize. The most well-known part like writings of his are his stories um his dying earth stories there's like um tales from the dying earth which is a collection of short stories and then there's um the eyes of the overworld kugel saga and Rialto the marvelous and you should read all of those and his great contribution to the fantastic genre in that part is the magic system of having specific spells on specific levels, having to prepare those in the morning because you only can cast a certain number of spells per day, per level. If that sounds familiar to you, it's because you've played Dungeons and Dragons. And yes, the Dungeons and Dragons magic system is taken from the first story in the first uh, Tales of the Dying Earth novel um, uh, books. And even some of those spells have made it into Dungeons and Dragons, like the Prismatic Spray, not your fantastic spray, Prismatic Spray that you may know or may not know. It's, you know, that kind of thing. So he was hugely influential there. He also gave the name to the Dying Earth genre, which was arguably, you know, developed or at least um, already done by Clark Ashton Smith in his uh, Sothic series and later on explored further in um, stuff like The Book of the New Sun by Jane Wolfe. And all three authors have a lot in common when it comes to their prose, tending towards the more verbose and baroque with a lot of like uncommon words in there and um, very elaborate dialogues, very elaborate prose in general and um, in the cases of Smith and uh, Vance, and in that case also a bit Fritz Leiber, Fritz Lieber, when you talk about his um, um, Fafford and Grey Mouse's stories, um, the very the, the ironic undertone. There's always a sense of humor in Jack Vance's writing. And if you're interested, I'll probably also do some videos on the Dying Earth at some point. Just let me know in the comments if you want that or not. But today we're talking about something of his later work, 
by which I mean the Leoness trilogy. As I said, it was released in the 1980s. Here's the elevator pitch, and you seriously, you should all go and read it. It's a trilogy of longer fantasy novels set in a fictitious part of our Earth, the Elder Isles, somewhere west of France and England, that have now sunken under the ocean. It takes place a couple of generations before the uh, the age of King Arthur, <coughs> if that actually exists. So, like, sort of around the fifth century BC, uh, BC, not BC, like Common Era. That's what I mean. And it um, deals with obviously Arthurian legends, um, folk myths, fairy tales, and uh, a bit of, of pseudo history. It is more a collection of stories that weave a tapestry of um, tales that portray a specific era and a specific place over, you know, a couple of, you know, a couple of years than just one ongoing plot. It is um, full of allusions to real world events, stories and whatnot. It is very much a mature story. It's an adult story. There's a lot of stuff in there that uh, will go way beyond the comfort level of kids these days, or any days actually. And uh, it's full of humor and a very fantastic prose. So on that level, if I'd rate it, it's five out of five Linda's Farns. Um, now to the difficulties there. You have to be aware that it takes a lot of inspiration from Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur and other Arthurian and generally medieval, late medieval romances. Also in prose. It goes and subverts those, but it takes part of that um, from the way it is told, which means it's a more distanced prose. You don't get any inner monologues. You don't get like insight into characters. It's all third person omniscient, omniscient narration. Which is different from what you get these days in most fantasy, contemporary fantasy. So if you're used to contemporary fantasy, this may be a bit of a shift of gears for you. Um, I think it's well worth it. The more stately pace of the narrative and of the prose add to that feeling that is being evoked here, which is closer to what you get from those older Arthurian and whatnot stories. Unlike, um, say, um, the very brutal um, deconstruction and destruction of Arthurian legend in, say, La Vitidars by Force Alone, this is a more gentle deconstruction. It is a deconstruction nevertheless. It is a subversion of tropes. It does all of that stuff. It just does it in a more refined and less aggressive way. It also plays, as I said before, with a lot of folk traditions, folk mythologies, and um, when I say that, I don't mean um, Disney versions of Grimm's fairy tales, I mean the real fucking deal. So there will be depictions of um, sexual violence in there, of general violence, and all the other terrible stuff that is so important for folklore, folk songs, folk myths, and whatnot, and has just been sanitized out of it in the words that we have for kids these days. So be aware of that. <clears throat> if, however, you're interested in going into that, you will also get geopolitics, you will get military interesting, uh, interesting military fiction uh, fantasy in there. You get, like, cool um, philosophical debates, humor, all of that. It's a, it's a panoply of all the things that fantastical fiction can offer, told through that light-hearted, not even light-hearted, but like slightly jocular, slightly um, light-hearted, verbose prose that you might also know from all kinds of um, picaresque novels, which is sort of the mode that um, Jack Vance always tends to uh, tends towards in his writings. I highly recommend reading all three of those books. I think they're way ahead of their time when it comes to how they do fantasy but um, they've been sadly overlooked by a lot of people I try to remedy this here now and just be aware there's so much packed into them that I could totally do like daily videos on those similar to the Malazan books there is that depth in there if you want it <clears throat> 
it's a different thing, but it has the same level of depth and um, same level of complexity to it. All right, now I'm going to drink some mead and then we're going to go into specific aspects of it. This is rather tart mead, which I personally appreciate because a lot of the other mead that you can drink these days is super sweet. And drinking a liter of sweet mead is bad for your health and your sanity and all the other things. It, it's super easy to do, though. Just saying. <laughs> so this is more like a very dry red wine in taste at this point, and I, I do like it. Anyway, so let's go into specific details. What does... Mm -hmm, this first one do. There's aspects that are already touched on in here that I will go into when we talk about the second one, the Green Pearl, probably sometime next week. So those will not be touched upon here, but they're already present. They'll just, you know, be explored in more detail in the second one. But let's first talk about gender roles. And gender roles are a big theme in here. Once again, we're talking about 1983, which, you know, this is not contemporary 2020s um, feminist literature. Of course not. <laughs> this is it. But it is doing some things right that a lot of fantasy at the time was not doing at all. What do I mean by that? Um, the, the main One of the main story arcs that we have in this book is the story of Soldrin and her garden. Soldrin is the princess of the kingdom of Leoness. Now, if you've read your um, Arthurian legends, you know that Leoness is the home kingdom of someone called Tristan. Now he goes and meets Isolde, and all kinds of ridiculous hijinks and non-consensual sex come from that, but that's a different story that we're not talking about today. Point is, that's sort of one of the connections that we have to Arthurian legend here. There's other stuff going in there, and like authors even men, uh, mentioned, because we have that omniscient later, like, telling the tales um, kind of narrator that goes like, yeah, this is the inspiration for King Arthur's Round Table, and this is this bit and this bit, and there's... And that's important to know that you have this distanced, ironic narrator, which, once again, I personally really appreciate. It leads a bit into the kind of thing that someone like Terry Pratchett does in his fantasy, this, like, bridging the gap between the fantasy world that you're talking about and our world in their narration. The, the fourth wall is more of like a net at this point, <laughs> not so much of a wall. Um, anyway, so what we have here is one of those ways that um, Jack Vance goes and deconstructs and subverts conventional tropes, which is, in this case, the story of King uh, Princess Soldrin. Now, King Casimir of Leoness is the guy who wants to reunite all the Elder Isles under his rule and whatnot. And he thinks of his daughter Soldrin as just one piece in the machine, so he wants to marry her to the most advantageous suitor that will give him the most power. So far, so good. This is one of the things that we know from fantasy stories, from fairy tales, from history. Um, at least from like the way we portray history right nowadays, and we write history nowadays. The queen, the, the princess being married off against her will is a trope. We've seen that before. It happens all the time. And just like in all our stories, Princess Saldron is not exactly happy to be married off to someone called Fode Carfilio, who's evil. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, point is, um, she doesn't want that. And this is where, where Vance goes and twists things, and in a good way, I think. He goes and says, like, yeah, well, she doesn't want that. So she doesn't marry him. It's not her being married off, um, being unhappy with the marriage, um, maybe starting an affair with someone and what, what you might expect. No, she says no. Her father gets pissed off and just locks her in her favorite garden down at the seaside. Like, yeah, well, you'll stay here until you change your mind. <laughs> Which obviously is another like fairy tale motive. You think of like Rapunzel and uh, being locked up in a tower. That that idea obviously also exists. 
and this is this is the magic of uh, the magic of these books it's like how they jump from fairy tale trope to fairy tale trope and just twist all of them because what happens is obviously that the prince shows up well, in this case the prince shows up as a survivor of well being thrown into the sea to be murdered and whatnot and just barely survives from being washed up at the beach and they fall in love and they plot um, they plot their escape. Now, what you might think, if you're like into fantasy in general, is like, yeah, well, they, they're gonna escape, they have a lot of adventures, and things will be good. Nope. What happens is, obviously, they get caught. One gets thrown into the dungeon, the other one gets locked up again, and commits suicide, because Jack Vance doesn't pull any punches. So, the way he goes through those things, to have the gender role of, <clears throat> that we associate, we personally associate with the Middle, middle Ages, which is the um, obedient wife that gets pushed around by males all the time, <laughs> is sort of there, but then again gets twisted because Soldren kind of gets her way. She's not, I mean, she's, she's punished for not, for standing up to her father, but she kind of wins in the end. Right? She's not married. So he does that, and then he he takes those other tropes, like the fairy tale trope of escaping with a true love. And it, yeah, it doesn't work. And the sad end is obviously, obviously suicide. Now we're coming to something here that is important to understand. Because I said there's a lot of connections to folklore. And when you look at folklore and folk music and folk ballads... Themes like unhappy love, um, power imbalances, uh, sexual assault, and suicide are omnipresent. They're every fucking where. Because that's how folk music works. You're like happy dancing around and whatnot is not how folklore works. Fairies aren't easy. Love ain't easy. And brutal motherfuckers take their what they want. And most of the time don't even get punished for it. So Jack Vance takes all of that and incorporates it in his story, which is oftentimes phrased in the way we would nowadays phrase our romanticized um, fantasy stories, our romanticized fa fairy tales, our romanticized folklore. But he doesn't leave out the darkness. He keeps the darkness in all the time, and he makes it very, very obvious. Which is why I said it is not a story for children. Per se, even though a lot of the themes seem to almost be fairy tale ish. Which is one of the things that I personally appreciate about it, and one of the things that I think we kind of are getting back to in a way, but not really, with things like adult fantasy. Well, when you look at it, what we do over time, and what it did over time, is we separated our stories, our fiction, if you will. We, we separate our stories into stories for kids and stories for adults. <laughs> kids get all the magic stuff, <laughs> all the fantastic stuff, and adults get all the serious stuff. We don't get the magic when, you're, when we're adult. Kids get the fairy tales sanitized in your Walt Disney versions with talking animals and princesses and fairies and all that stuff. But it's all happy. There's no darkness in there. Like the not really darkness in there and um, you as an adult you go and read i don't know serious fiction about people being miserable brutal and violent and but leave the supernatural out of it and while there's certainly something to be said about um, keeping some of the violence out of children's stories there's nothing to be said about keeping the fantastic out of adult stories and when you go back i don't know a century and a half or what um, there were only tales. Now, this is obviously related to the fact that education and entertainment were very different in, say, the 17th century or like 18th or even 19th century. But the separation between kids' entertainment and adult entertainment is an artificial one in the last century. That not all of that is bad. But I feel we've gone too far. And it's like, yeah, don't tell your children all about sexual violence all the time. That's not what it, you know, that's that has like serious implications don't do that but don't at the other end also think that all the magic is only for kids jack vance in this story and you know as i said um, adult fantasy of today 
kind of does the same thing, and it's one of the reasons why stuff like Game of Thrones and George, uh, Joe Abercrombie and whatnot um, is so successful is because they brought back the magic to adult fiction. I feel, however, that um, Jack Vance goes a step further because he's not like, I'll do grimy contemporary fiction and put some magic elements in there, some supernatural elements in there. No, he's like, no, I'll put the fairy tales in there and I'll show you all the darkness and all the brutality that is in fairy tales. And he does that in a wonderful way, especially in these stories, uh, in the in the Leoness trilogy, which, once again, is an absolute masterpiece and... I wish more people would read it. So yeah, gender roles, and they show up again and again, because you have the idea that everyone is just playing roles in that firm structure. King Casimir is playing his role, he has to take over the islands again, because that's sort of his job, because his, con his dynasty used to rule the place, and all that stuff. And his queen was just married because of all these like rules, and now he's taking, <laughs> now she's taking solace which is her name, you know. Vance is very explicit about his humor sometimes, so Queen Solace is obviously called Solace because she is also in need for, uh, of Solace for her unhappy marriage and just performing her duties and as a piece in that large machine. And she's looking for all of that in spirituality. And one of the spiritualities you lo she's looking into is Christianity, which brings us to Brother Umfred, the epitome of the hypocritical uh, Christian. Now, this is one of the things that you don't get in Arthurian legend, because most priests in Arthurian legend, or even in Robin Hood stories and all of that stuff, the priests are usually good. You have the idea of the morally bankrupt Vatican really early in history, um, in literature, I don't know, like 14th century is sort of what I would call like not early in literature, but sort of when we have like a lot of literature. You go, you read your Boccaccio, all the priests are always corrupt and uh, pervert, uh, sexual perverts, and all the rest. Um, and it goes sort of in that way. So this is very much a play on 14th century, 13th, 14th, and 15th century literature in a lot of ways. Because Brother Umfred is. He's a pervert. He's taking advantage. He's taking all the money he can get by being as... <laughs> by playing to all the weaknesses of the queen. He also goes and sexually assaults um, Princess Saldron when he gets a chance. And here's the kicker, though, the, the important bit there. He does still think of himself as a good Christian. This is where this is where the real criticism is because it's easy to go and like let's criticize religions like yeah there's a lot of people pretending to be holy that aren't holy they are preaching you know they're preaching water and drinking wine. Brother Umfred as a Christian in this one is unabashedly that way. Whereas the, on the other hand you also have depictions of like truly um, truly devout Christians who also think that they are doing the right thing. So the idea that there is such a thing as true faith, true religion, or true belief, what have you, uh, that is married to moral correctness, is completely destroyed in these books, in a way that is absolutely fascinating to me. So we have that. Um, now let's go further into the dark. I guess, um, because, you know, the sun is setting and all of that. <laughs> Let's do that, shall we? <sighs> all right. The next big thing there is, once again, sexuality. Sexuality is a huge theme in the Leoness trilogy. <laughs> In all kinds of ways. Now, there's sexual violence aplenty. Um, I've already spoken about Brother Umfred attacking, assaulting Saldron. He's prevented by Prince Eilas, and that kind of works out in a way. But there's more of it. And it's very much connected to the magical element. Now, there's obviously that whole idea that our look at the supernatural, at fairies, at fairy the fey folk intruding into our world is a metaphor for sexual violence, for um, sexual divergence, whatever you want to call it. And once again, I'm not judging here. That's not the point. The point is that over the time, we're still talking about something that is, at this point, 40 years old. Um, 
So obviously things have changed again since then. Um, but the main the main issue that I'm trying to make here, point that I'm trying to make here, is that for a long time, elements in fairy tales, in stories, <laughs> that idea of the the fairy intrusion into our world, changelings, <laughs> all of that stuff has been. Um, connected to um, sexual improprieties according to the sexual moralities at the time. And um, Jack Vance is obviously aware of that, and the writings are obviously aware of that, but he goes one step further because this is a fantasy story, and um, while we have um, sexual violence, sexual transgressions in just the human, the human part of it, we also have it in the fairy part. It's that that idea that the fa that the fey world, the fairy world, is um, runs according to very different moralities. There are obviously ideas that you know the like, contracts are extremely binding, but the other parts of morality, human morality, are just non-existent. Um, so we have all these ideas that, for example, sexuality is way different in the fairy world. You have all these trolls with huge dicks going around raping people, which is terrible and fucked up, and it's clear that it's terrible and fucked up, but that's just how fairies are in that world. <laughs> which, you know, comes through that whole idea of Queen, uh, of um, Twisk the fairy, mother of... Um, of Princess Maduk, who we'll talk about later, and adoptive mother, because we have the changeling thing going on of Droon. And uh, how that happens. Like, you read that story, it, and it's told in the... And this is sort of where Jack Vance's genius shows up. It's told in the very humorous, light-hearted way that fairy tales are often told. And it's like, yeah, there's a troll, and he captures the fairy. And he's like, yeah, I'm gonna rape you. And she's like... Well, I use the the only magic I can, and um, well, she shrinks his his dick to put not, uh, not to put a final point on it. It's like yeah, she <laughs> she shrinks his dick, and he's like fuck that, I'm gonna nail you to a pillory, and you can't get off this until three people have come and just um, done whatever they want with you, which is very much uh, clearly um, meant in a sexual way because this is very much just a sexual tale. And it's still told as a fairy tale, and it's interesting and fascinating because when you go back into like 16th, 17th century ballads and folk stories, that shit happens all the time. There maybe not in that explicit way, but that kind of thing happens all the time. You 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 listen to folk uh, actual folk songs and you read their lyrics. That happens all the time. It's not a proper folk song if no one kills themselves, gets killed, or is raped. That's just not <laughs> happening there back in the time. And Vance pulling those elements and putting them into a, at the time, contemporary and still, I would argue, way more modern novel than a lot of other fantasy that has been written since, kind of brings that back into our consciousness. Into our con yeah, and that's, that's fascinating because at the same time, he he is well aware of all these other elements of fairy tales, of folk beliefs, of folk uh, folklore that have made it into our contemporary world. The the, the numerological myths, like it's the the novel is full of these magical numbers, like fairies um, get you, you know, fairies curse you to dance for a thousand day, for like a year, a week, and a day, or you get seven years of bad luck, and it's like seven people, and then they're like three people. Those numbered magics are there all the time. <clears throat> because that's that's part of how we as a society have evolved and have kept those things going while we have gotten rid of, rid of other parts. And Jack Vance is just pulling back all these darker things that we have covered up, probably. Um, and he's pulling them back into like the main view. On the other hand, even though the language is sometimes weird and also very obscure and sometimes disparaging, this book is very much open to other forms of sexuality. One of the main driving things there is a homosexual relationship between um, the wizard Camurello and uh, Fold Carfilio. Now, you can argue that it's a problem that the two main villains, arguably one well, of the ab absolute villain who's probably King Casimir, but the other ones are homosexual. And that's certainly a concern that is important here. 
I would, however, argue that their homosexuality is incidental and is like actually that part is very much separated from the stuff that mostly like it's basically it's only Fode Carphilia who is doing all the other stuff, um, uh, all the evil stuff at, in this one. It's it's separated in a way, and it's not the only homosexual um, um, relationship or like homosexuality is just a more or less accepted part of the story because this is the point. It's like, while everyone kind of knows that Fode Carfilio is evil, no one claims that he's evil for being in a homosexual relationship with the wizard Tamurello. They're just lovers. That's just like common knowledge, and no one has a problem with that. And that's once again for for like a for a fantasy written in 1983. That's pretty fucking good. Just saying. Um, there's obviously way more happening in this novel than, and in the following ones. We're gonna come back to much of those. Um, but before we drop the whole like sexual component, we also have one more theme there that is very important and that's once again the idea of male privilege and men forcing their privilege on women in the whole storyline of Melanchthy who is sort of the symbol of innocence there and we have first Shemrod who's supposed to be a good guy but when you look at his love story with Melanchthy the way he tries to get it on with her is at least creepy, and more, more or less way beyond that. And um, then later on, Fode Carfilio just plain up goes and rapes her, because that's non-consensual sex that's happening there. And what is interesting there is that the way she deals with it afterwards is, I feel like, I mean, this is only like half a page, if at all. But the way it's done is just really smart because, like, you have her on the one hand declaring him to be just a phantom and so forth. She have like the whole, the whole idea of denial, but at the same time she punishes him by just like blasting him to the other end of the world. Well, not the end of the world, but the end of the realm. There, at the same time, I and mean, that happens. Which you know, there's a lot of things to be criticized about these books, but for something written at the time in 1983 by someone who was already an old white man at the time, to put it mildly, is pretty impressive, is what I'm trying to say here. And uh, still well worth reading and uh, talking about 40 years later. So, let's leave the sexual part behind and talk about the next interesting bits before I end up in total darkness. All right, ideas of realism. Now, that's obviously something that we have in in fantasy literature a lot, that we talk about a lot in fantasy literature. Um, you have the idea that, you know, we either stay completely in-universe, don't use words that are not connected to it, we never, ever fucking break the fourth wall unless we're Terry Pratchett, or Jack Mads in this case. We... Um, on the other hand, try to describe um, military operations, armor, clothes, and stuff as detailed as bloody possible, even if we're using words that were only made up later and whatnot. And Jack Vance kind of goes all out on that one. He breaks the fourth wall continuously by referencing stuff to later history, by referencing stuff in the world out there. I mean, he can do that because it's all set in our world and a fictitious part of our world, but it's set in our world. So he can reference general philosophy, general religion, general geography, and whatnot in history. But he references, you know, he references King Arthur and other stuff that is happening supposedly in the future of what he's talking about, which emphasizes and re-emphasizes this, um, reinforces this idea of this being a discussion, a parody, a... I don't want to call it a parody, but like a play on Arthurian stories or the matter of France and other medieval, late medieval romantic literature. 
but you also have the same thing, right? You remember that the the story of King Arthur is like shows up first in Geoffrey of Monmouth's A History of England, right? When it's already told as a history, so you need to have that like dimension around it. It's not a happening now. It's a looking back at what happened back then kind of story, and it does that marvelously. He also goes and does something that. Um, most fantasy at the time didn't do because it's not what you usually expect or what history does and historiography does and even fictitious historiography like Geoffrey of Monmouth do it's like to put like strategy in there and tactics in there the level of like who is attacking whom and why people are occupying specific castles and getting to specific places to force someone to do something and marry someone to gain access to a specific um, family line to get in line for the kingship of a different country and stuff like that is way more on the sides of on the lines of historiography is way more on what you might get there than you uh, in his yes yeah, in historiography and legendary than you will get in fantasy fiction even something as military as black company which was sort of at, starts at the same time roughly than um, Leoness does have very little like large scale strategy because it's ha I mean it has a radical like first person narrative so people don't know the big picture Jack Vance gives you the biggest possible picture all the time. He's okay, and then he has this plan, he does that for this reason and this reason. You get all of that. And then you get details. Then you get like really minuscule details on shipbuilding and how to laminate wood and why you do that and all of that stuff in there. <clears throat> Which contrasts with the idea of this being a fairy tale with fairies doing fairy stuff and having fairy adventures. And then, yeah, but you also have to understand that you laminate different woods of different strengths together to actually gain flexibility and tension on specific parts of a boat and you build it in a specific way <clears throat> to gain more like um, specific um, ways of how it will behave in the water. This is not, you know, your Cam Aslan on naval battle, but it's like on, on levels of shipbuilding, on how armor works and stuff like that. The level of detail is staggering and fascinating, which is really interesting compared to what you will get in most fantasy at the time and still today. And he does that while still breaking the fourth wall and doing all the over-the-top fantasy stuff because he doesn't, you know, it's something I've, I've complained about before. The idea that our fantasy has become way too realistic. It's like, yeah, you have like magic and stuff, but he's like, yeah, well, there's fairies. Also, this guy has a cart with like two horses that each have two heads. Also, they have like tiger feet and claws. And you're like, that will never fly. If Joe John Martin would write something like that, or Joe Abercrombie would write like something like that, or even Brandon Sanderson would write something like that, people would like, that's so unrealistic it's bloody fantasy it doesn't have to be realistic fairy tales are exactly built on that that you have on the one hand you have patterns that are ingrained in our society in our culture in the way we think about things but they're also at the same time always this there's always that wild element that will break out and just completely throw all of that stuff over the over and that's that's in there as well now to go back to bring this because we're like almost in the complete blackness at this point um <laughs> to bring it down to the end this book what it does so well is it kind of constrains different aspects of it to different parts of it you have your king casimir plot line which is more the geopolitical one you have your Drun, which we haven't spoken about. I've just mentioned Drun for the first time, which is obviously the son of King Eilis and um, um, Princess Soldron, who's going to be the fairy prince and whatnot, your King Arthur equivalent. Well, not your King Arthur, but we'll, we'll talk about that in the next couple of books. And you have him with the whole fairy storyline being a changeling, getting seven years of bad luck, having all the magical stuff going. You have... Um, your eyeless with your more visceral fantasy story being stuck in and the oubliette <laughs> we never spoken about oubliettes 
which we should at some point because I feel the word already is so explained. It's, you know, comes from the French, like oublier, which means like, to forget. It's like it's a hole that you drop someone in and then forget about them. And that's exactly what happens to Eilus there, but he gets out of it and then he becomes a slave and you have that whole like slave and other stuff going on. And we talk about that next time around when we're talking about the scar, because I didn't talk about the scar yet. Um, point is, um, you have these different stories that all mesh together into this like larger portrait of a brilliantly vibrant world of a brilliantly magnificently vibrant world full of stories where everything is possible everything is dangerous but also magical at the same time and it's so fascinating and it's so easy to fall into that to drown in all of these small bits and pieces and stories and the way they shift around it's it's like one of those huge medieval tapestries that just tell the entire tale of the last 50 years of norman rule or whatever or one of those like one of those um illumination uh, illuminated pages in like an illuminated manuscript from the middle age when you have like a grand theme and then you have all these small bits and pieces small animals and demons poking out of the woodwork and uh, the, the plants and whatnot down in the, <laughs> the edges of the page and whatnot it's like that and it's so fascinating it's so worth to read and reread and drown in all of those details and i haven't even spoken about the humor the dialogues the fantastic philosophy um, and the, the the references of weird shit that's going on there. This is a magical book, and people should read it. And I'm I'm devastated that no one is doing it. Well, if you've made it so far, I assume you have. And if not, I beg you to do so. But please let me know in the comments what you think about it. If you have, um, please let me know if we should actually go and do like a buddy read thing at some point because i'm ready to reread it like any time we could do like a buddy read and go into like deeper details at some point let me know what you think thanks for watching if you liked it i don't know share subscribe do the do the good things i'll talk to you later until then cheers